Uh, my name is Amy Strickland, and I'm going to be moderating this e-panel. We'll be joined shortly by Blake Northcott and J.L. Bryan, Jeff Bryan. Uh, they're having some technical difficulties. But what we are planning to do today is talk to you about independent publishing. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to start by introducing um, ourselves, who we are, what we do, and talking about one of our books that we'd like to uh, plug at the beginning, and then we'll move into questions. If you have questions, you can tweet them at MatterDeep. Is this backwards, everybody? No. Nope. Okay, nope. good. That's it's good. backwards on my camera. Uh, tweet them at MatterDeep on Twitter, uh, and you can use the hashtag selfpubchat to comment and talk about it. So uh, let's start with Bobby. Bobby is coming to us via audio today. Yes, hi. Hello. Um, um, yes, I'm Bobby Nash. I write all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm probably best known for writing the, uh, the novel Evil Ways, which uh, is a suspense thriller. Uh, that, that originally came out in 2005, and uh, uh, in 2012 I re-released it uh, novel to get it back out. So that's me. That's you. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, Carly. Uh, I am Carly Strickland. I uh, I make children's books. This is one of my books, Mother Shukus. Um, and aside from children's books, I also do um, cover designs for Matter Deep Publishing and for various other independent publishers. And I do interior layouts, and I'm just the, like the design, independent publishing design guru. I just hand out free advice, too. So, Thank you, Carly. And Kyle? Um, I'm a writer and head editor of Matter Deep Publishing. Um, I wrote Say No to Sparkles, a collection of vampire short fiction, and I'm currently working um, on a vampire novel called Mars One. Should be a lot of fun. All right. Uh, my name is Amy Lee Strickland. I'm the author of the Olympia Heights series, as well as the Royer Goldhawk series. Uh, as you might have heard before, Carly, Kyle, and I are uh, three-fifths of Matter Deep Publishing, which is a small independent Bir Birmingham publishing company. Uh, and I am the chief web officer. I'm in charge of marketing and internet stuff, all of the websites and uh, all e-commerce, all that stuff. So um, I really had hoped that uh, our other panelists would have been able to get in by now. And uh, ironically, um, hang on, I'm getting a message from Jeff. The right profile. Okay. Um, so, ironically, we're trying to figure out our technical difficulties via Facebook. Um, but we we can get started with the people here, and I'll just skip to some of the questions that I think um, would be good for the people who are already here. So, um, one of the questions that I had that I guess Carly is best qualified to answer, one of the questions posed was um, color printing. When you are printing an art book or a comic book or a picture book, what kind of considerations do you need to make for getting color printing done? I mean, all I mean, all of the considerations. If you're going with color, it's likely that you know the the color is the important part because if it wasn't important, you wouldn't be getting it done in color. So you've got to find a printer. <clears throat> with paper quality and um, color quality that you can get, you know, on your budget and, you know, match your vision, which color printing is always going to be more expensive um, than black and white printing. And a lot of times, like when we created our, our art book, Incognito Project, we had to go with a traditional printer, which most of our... Um, most of our products are not. They're, most of our products are print on demand, and we had to go with a traditional printer because there's just it's so much harder to get that kind of quality that we wanted at a print on demand. All right, thank you. Um, so let's talk about print on demand versus small press. Um, Bobby, what do you use for your books? 
for the ones that I do myself um, through through Ben books, where uh, like my novel Evil Ways or Deadly Games, those novels, uh, for those I use print on demand um, because most of my sales tend to be uh, ebook. I found any, and so I use the POD for the print copies, and that has worked out pretty well for me. But then I, uh, for some of the publishers that I work with are small press, and so they do print runs. But for the stuff I do myself, it's usually a print-on-demand thing. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we're joined by uh, J.L. Bryan is his author name, Jeff. Uh, nice to see you, Jeff. Hi. Hi. Uh, if you just want to take a moment to introduce yourself and uh, if you have any current releases that you want to you know, promote, that would be a good time to do that now. No, I'm still trying to. Hopefully Blake will be here in a moment. She's having technical difficulties with the plug-in. Hold on. Yeah, I am too. Hold on. Where did I can't find it where it went. By uh, J. L. Bryan is his author name, Jeff. Uh, nice to see you, Jeff. Is this working? All right. Yes. Yeah, you're live. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I guess I'm best known for the Jenny Pox series or whatever. I have a, I can relate. Um, so as I was saying, yeah, I guess the Jenny Pox books are the most popular one. I've been doing uh, indie publishing since some sometime in 2010, and I've been a full-time writer for a couple of years, and. What was my most recent release was called The Unseen. It's a horror novel, sort of similar to the Jenny Fox books. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, right now, what we're talking about is we're talking about uh, print on demand and small press printing and making sure that you get good quality. Um, so we're talking kind of about what, what we look for when we decide to print paperbacks. You've printed some paperbacks of Jenny Fox. Do you use Create Space for that? Hold on. I feel like I have a time delay here. Okay, yeah, I use CreateSpace. I'm not happy okay. with them. It's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of the things that I find with CreateSpace is sometimes our covers come a little dark the first time because they are a digital print run, uh, and digital printers tend to print colors a little darker. So uh, one of the things that we find is best to do is to always order a proof so that once it comes with, you know, the blacks indiscernible from each other and that kind of thing, you can lighten it up a little and try again. You said uh, uh, you said uh, uh, digital printing tends to print dark. Everything, everything always <laughs> tends to print dark. Always assume that they're going to print darker than what you see on your computer screen because your printing is, you know, it's made out of ink and not light the way your computer screen is. So always make it lighter. Bef just go ahead and do it before you even send it in for the proof. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the questions that I think are really we really want Blake for, and we'll come back to those. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm getting another message from her. She can hear you, but she cannot see you. Let me try to join the group. All right, so she's hopefully going to be here shortly. Um, yeah, we'll see if she gets in in a second, and if not, I'll keep trying to troubleshoot with her. Um, but let's see. So we talked a little bit about making sure that you get good color printing. Um, editing, proofreading, that process. Let's just go around and each talk about kind of what we do for our editing process um, because that's one of the things, you know, we don't have professional editors as independent authors, so it's important for us to have a good process. So let's start with Bobby. Uh, well, uh, for the stuff that I do on my own, uh, is on my end, um, I have other author friends that we've taken to trading, uh, edit, edit, editing advice with one another, where I will read their novel, they'll read mine, and then we'll give editorial advice that way, because we're, we, we kind of know from experience of having edited other people, uh, you kind of get some feedback that way, which I found very helpful. And then, because, right, because I can't afford to hire a professional editor, but, um, I found that the barter system works really well when you're working with other writers who have editing experience. Definitely, yeah. Okay, um, how about you, Carly? 
for my editing, um, for I guess my illustrations and stuff, to make sure it looks right, I always try to look at it in the mirror or um, black and white because that makes a big difference for art. I don't know how many people are going to be really interested in that process, but... Well, we did have a lot of picture book authors who were interested in the indie oh. guide. Uh -huh. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you've got, you know, your drawings or whatever and something's not looking right or you feel like this, this could be slightly better but I don't know why, put it in black and white, flip it, put it upside down, turn it around, because that, just looking at it from a slightly different perspective will really, um, really help in that way. And then, I don't know. I haven't written anything, so I can't really tell you about that, that editing process. Okay. Uh, Jeff? Uh, very similar to what Bobby said. We, uh, I, I used to uh, hire a few people to edit my books, and it's gone to a barter system for the most part. And I was finding that the, 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 the feedback I was getting from other authors was as good as what I was paying for from the editors, so we just I've, I've gone to mostly a, a barter system. Editing. All right, Kyle, your process. Well, um, editing for me is a, it's about several different several different things. Um, the first step in the editing process for me is to look at the work as a whole um, and, and figure out what direction the work is is going in. Um, this is something that I care a lot about. I was a professional writing uh, major, um, so this is. Um, I, I like helping a work get to where it wants to go, what basically meet its full potential. Um, and I'm so, sorry. Um, Paul, sorry. Come here. Continue, Kyle. I will shut the dog up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, uh, editing process for me, it, it's really look at, look at it with different hats on. So the first hat that I look at a, a work in is um, basically does it, does it make sense? Is it, is it following its own rules? And then I uh, look at it through a lens of um, is, is it following appropriate story structure? Um, is it, is it a, a entertaining? Um, is, is, is it going for something and not reaching it, or why would it not be reaching it? And then beyond that, we start getting into little details. We start getting into how the sentences fit together, the grammar. And so it's really look at it big, start getting smaller and smaller and more detailed as you refine it. So that, that's really my editing process. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, let me... Um, unfortunately, our neighbors have a very large... Jeep and my dog thinks that he needs to defend us from it. Um, so, editing process. Uh, as Matterdeep Publishing, we all kind of take a hand at it, and that's kind of kind of the nice thing uh, is that we don't really need to go to too many outside editors. We have Kyle, who has a professional writing degree. Uh, I'm an English teacher, so I know a good deal about grammar, uh, and then also, you know, our CEO, Terry, takes a look, Dan, the CFO. So everybody takes a look at it, uh, and usually I hand it off to Carly first, uh, although I handed off one of my last books to Kyle first. Carly watches a, there, Kyle in the back of my video, uh, watches a lot of TV and movies, knows a lot about narrative structure, and is pretty good at identifying when something is cliched or stupid or doesn't work, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I take it back and I make edits, and then Kyle gets it for content. I think it's important to not try to edit for grammar and spelling while you're trying to edit for content. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I agree. You get yes. kind of hung up on that, and you're going to miss too much. And so uh, we edit it in different phases for content, and then it goes off and everybody gets around, and I, I always have the last look at it. Uh, one of the things that we're adding, though, is my brother is incredibly good at finding my typos that make it to print. So uh, we're going to start, you know, giving books to the beta readers, the people that we know are going to buy it anyway, uh, giving them the book to let them have a preview a few weeks ahead so that they can pull out any typos that, you know, even Stephen King novels have typos in them. You're never going to be perfect, but the more sets of eyes that look at it, the more you're going to catch. Something else that's really useful, again, I, it's like looking at it in black and white 
instead or looking at it in the mirror is after you've got your proof, read it again. Yeah. Because having yeah. it in a different format or put it on your Kindle before you get your proof and read it on there instead of reading it on the same, you know, Word document or, you know, printing it out in different typefaces even um, will uh, will help you find Yeah, stuff. your brain kind of fills yeah. stuff in. I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I like to. Yeah, re reading it aloud helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially yeah. in terms of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they're great on paper until you try to read them and realize they don't fit well in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that helps a lot. Yeah, I think All there's right, many different gonna... ways you can encounter the manuscript. Is better. It's just better, it gets better the more ways you can encounter it. We're getting uh, messages from Blake on Facebook. She's having a hard time getting in with the plugins. Uh, maybe Google hates the Canadian Google. I don't know. But uh, she says that she agrees on don't edit for content and spelling at the same time. You need different hats for these jobs, and you can't split your focus. Uh, and I have edited one of Blake's books, and so I know she kind of she has a whole bunch of beta readers that she goes to to get services done. And uh, I was specifically a grammar person, uh, but you know different hats and sometimes having different friends who are good at different things. Yeah, that's the uh, other thing I, I was going to say. Yeah, if you have someone's completely different to do the final proofreading, you know, who hasn't who hasn't read it at all before, that 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 helps. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rather than having the same people read it over and over. All right. So um, we're going to talk about covers now, and we might just have to. Uh, Blake's going to keep trying to get in, but we might just have to um, have me reading her comments from Facebook, uh, unfortunately, but. Um, cover art, uh, and I think we'll go to Carly last because she's probably the most experienced with this. But um, how do you get your cover art? If you hire somebody, where do you find them, and what kind of considerations would you make? Let's start with Kyle. Well, it's Carly, so um, okay. that's that's pretty much who I go to uh, for my cover art. I happen to my sister happens to be a fantastic cover designer. I mean, look at this thing. I mean. That's genius, um, but uh, that's that's really where I go to. Um, I don't I don't really I don't have any need to go outside of that. All right, um, Jeff. Um, I've used a couple different cover artists. I enjoy looking for artists and looking at their work and um, trying to think what I can do. I've used uh, Claudia from Fat Puppy Art for several of them, uh, the majority of them. And then more recently, Mallory Rock. I, I've looked at. I've looked more into uh, the pre-made covers that are a lot, a lot cheaper. If I can find something that you know speaks to, that seems to be right for the book. I was fortunate to find that the unseen cover was a pre-made. It was like seventy-five dollars. It was really a good deal. It, look, it looked just like I didn't even know what I wanted for the cover. So it's just kind of an intuitive process to me. I don't know. You try to get something that looks right for your subgenre, so people will know what kind of book it is. And other than that, it's just kind of. A very subjective process. I, I enjoy it a lot, mainly because I don't have to do the work myself. I just have to have opinions. Where um, did you find pre-made covers? Um, there was um, there was a there's a there's a group on Go on Facebook somebody put me into that has a lot of cover artists, and that was um, that was where I found this person. But I, I think it's much easier to find a good artist than to find a good editor because you can look right at the work and kind of get a sense right away. Of what their work is going to be, and whereas with with an, with an editor, it's so much harder to find an editor. Um, but yeah, the cover art is one of the most fun parts for me. I like to sometimes get the cover art done well before the book's even finished, just so I can kind of look at it and say, "Oh, that's the book I'm writing. That looks like a cool book," <laughs> or something. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I like having the cover ahead of time too, and I usually uh, put Carly to work before my draft is done. Carly does your covers. Carly cool. does my covers. Yeah, um, Carly does my covers, and I'm a little more involved in my cover art than Kyle is. Like for yes. instance, uh, this cover was actually a collaborative process between Carly and our CEO Terry, who is a painter, uh, Terry Strickland Art. But um, we actually hired this guy Nick. He's a painter in Birmingham and came and did a photo shoot with him and then photoshopped things together. Uh, and the rest of the Olympia Heights covers have kind of, you know, I've been finding the models for them and saying, this person is my character. Uh, I use modelmayhem.com to cast local models and we pay them like 50 bucks for an hour and they come in and do some photos. Um, we ended up for my Royer Goldcock cover using our buddy Pete, who's an actor out in LA. And then Carly kind of takes them from there 
And, you know, I tell her kind of what I want, and she reads the draft or at least reads the synopsis before she gets started. And then, you know, I trust her at that point, and usually what she comes up with is better than my imagination could have. Uh, that's kind of one of the things I think my tip for people hiring a cover artist is don't get too locked into what you want because if yeah. you're not an artist, and even if you are an artist, sometimes what you think you want at the beginning is terrible. And if you get locked into it and you say, okay, I want you to use this font and this font together and I want it to be this color and here I've given you the hex code for it and here is my photo, uh, you could make a monster and, you know, the best graphic designer in the world, if they have really strict parameters, might not be able to make it work. How about you, Bobby? Well, uh with uh, the publishers handle finding the artist and getting the covers put together uh, if it's something that I am the sole author on I have some input there you know they'll send sketches to me to approve that nature um, on the ones that I do myself um, I generally do them um, I like to take the because uh, I write a lot of most of the stuff I self-publish are like modern-day suspense thriller type novels so I take photos and do a blend of things to, to, to get the photos together. Like uh, my, my novel, Deadly Games, the cover, and I uh, had a friend of mine for the cover. and So we did the front cover, the back cover, a lot of different shots. But like you, what you were saying before, my original idea ended up getting molded and changed as I was putting it together. Because my original idea, while it worked... On the cover, it, it, it was missing something. So being able to take and change it helped a lot because I think it made it a more dynamic cover. And it's I enjoy doing the covers. And kind of like what Carly was saying, too, with looking at them in different perspectives, one thing that I find with covers, if you've got something you're happy with, distance and see if it still works from a distance because people are thumbnail size so you have to be able to sell it at a, at a small size which is very, or, or if, if you do happen to get to a bookstore they see it from down the hall or down the aisle if you can see it that way and it still works you know it it works because if you can't read the title you know from across the office then, it, the, then you might have the wrong font. Definitely. And, you know, like you said, those Amazon thumbnails, uh, people are going to judge your book. Most people aren't going to click to open it. They're going to judge your book based on that thumbnail. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you have to try it and shrink it down, make sure it, make sure it's not going to get muddy at that small size. And, and that a lot of times will determine what image is used. Sometimes the image might not work if, it, if it's too small. Same with the font. So, yeah, you have to play around with different colors and different sizes. And you so, be very yeah, it's, careful it's, with absolutely. fonts. Yeah. 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 Okay, and, I uh, usually, and I usually have a, I usually have a few artists that I know, too, that I will put together three or four options and send around to and say, from a design perspective, which do you like better? So that helps as well. All right. Uh, I got a comment from Blake here coming through Facebook. Uh, she says, cover art for me is important to set the tone for the book. I was fortunate to find an amazing artist that had artwork that really spoke to me. As a sci-fi fantasy type book, the image on the cover reflects that. Actually, people like the cover so much that they asked me for prints of the image. Mine were all by Amir Sahil Salihi. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that pronunciation. She found him on DeviantArt. She says, uh, she says, I contacted him directly about his work, and he sent me additional images. So DeviantArt is a great place. There's plenty of amateur artists on there and professional artists who are uh, willing to do commissions. So they're very upfront, a lot of them, with their pricing structure. And, you know, I mean, if you contact a stranger online and you don't like their prices, you can always never email them again and you won't be too embarrassed. So, <laughs> so that's a good place. All right, so... Um, Let's talk about some big pet, some big no-nos, some big red flags that you see when, uh, when you know, when you see a cover that's just really bad. Uh, I was gonna say for me, it's probably um, too much clutter, too much going on when they're they're photoshopping elements together. You know, the movie poster that was really popular in the early 2000s with like, let's put all of the characters and the background and the titles and a tagline. Uh, trying to put that all on a book cover would be probably my biggest whoa step off. 
How about you, Kyle? What's what's one thing that you see a lot on bad book covers? Oh, well, um, what I see uh, on bad book covers, it, it's usually, it, it has nothing to do with the book. That's something that that'll it'll kind of be a red flag for people when they're looking at a book. If they look at a book cover and they say, I like what's on this book cover, and then they read the synopsis on the back and they're this doesn't connect, then they're going to put it back. They're not, if they see like a big Zeppelin and then they re start reading the back and it's like in the year, you know, 3000, everyone is robots, you know, like it doesn't, they're not going to, and, and it's, of course, that's an extreme uh, example or whatever, but it's something that, it's really good to have something that actually represents uh, the book uh, without necessarily giving anything away. Uh, about it. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of the times when I've seen, especially in indie books, where people try to do their own covers, I know that if I tried to do my own cover, it would look like a piece of garbage. Because um, I am not a designer. I am a writer and an editor. So um, it would be stick people. And, you know, of course, um, I've seen some stuff that's been poorly photoshopped. I've seen some stuff that... Um, it has been obviously just pulled from like a Google image search that's not quite um, probably even legal to really be using that image. I've seen that too. Uh, yeah, yeah, and and that's something that you know it makes makes me nervous. Um, so and I think that that's definitely a big um, barrier a lot of people face when they when it, it, the book might be good, but if your cover is something like that, then it, it people aren't going to pick it up. That's that's definitely a big one. Um, I've actually seen there's a series out there who um, I used to do a lot of Harry Potter role playing, and so uh, I recognize a lot of the people people like to use for faces of Harry Potter characters. And I remember seeing a cover out there. Someone just slapped a, a plaster filter on Cynthia Dicker, who's a Victoria's Secret model, uh, and and I recognized her immediately because everybody in the world tried to use her for Ginny Weasley for a while. So. Um, you know, that kind of makes me nervous that somebody is going to get sued. Even if their book is fantastic, don't use copyrighted images. There's, like, a rule that if you change something, like, 95%, but don't be safe. Use morgue file. Use your own photos. Um, don't use – buy stock images if you have to. But uh, don't go find something off of Google and expect to put it on a cover and get away with it. Uh, Teal has joined us by audio yay. only. Hey. Uh, yay. Yay. Yeah. So, um, Teal, why don't we take a break from this cover discussion quickly for you to introduce yourself. I am sorry about that. <laughs> introduce yourself and one of your books. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, uh, I am so sorry. I've been trying to get on, and I thought it was Central Standard Time. I didn't even look. It is, I'm a ditz. I apologize. No um, worries. I have messed up on a podcast for Bobby with Time Zone before. So. And this is only the second time I've even attempted to do a Google chat, so I was very lost, and I'm, I've am i been trying for 15 minutes, I think, now to get on. <laughs> but finally, I am on, and um, thanks for having me. Um, I am Teal Haviland. I am a new author. You guys have way more experience than I do, but my first book um, of a series called The Reaping Chronicles came out um, it is called Inception, and it was originally going to be with a traditional publisher, but we did not see eye to eye on the cover, actually. Um, and because I had equal say in the contract, which was not honored, I chose to bail because it was not going to brand my series properly. Um, it would have been very Harlequin teen romance looking. But that is just not what The Reaping Chronicles is. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about me. I also started a publishing company. It's a fledgling as well, and I also do some uh, cover design. I'm growing that business slowly as I learn more about it. Um, so anyway, that's a little about me, and thank you for having me and putting up with my antics here today. Sorry. Oh, thank you for coming to you. Okay, uh, we do have a comment back. We're, we're discussing, uh, just in case uh, you're wondering, we're discussing cover design, and uh, we already talked a little bit about where we uh, go for covers. Um, and now we're talking about cover design faux pas. Uh, Blake says, I agree. If the image doesn't reflect the idea of the book, the reader can be confused. Same for the design. Example, I was told by a publisher that there should be no border. Image should bleed right over. I actually went with a wraparound cover since the image was so fantastic, and it was visually interesting and different, so I felt it might set it apart from others. So if you've never seen uh, Blake's cover for Arena Mode, 
you should Google that, check it out. It was a top funded project on Kickstarter this year and wow. uh, top, I think, top funded publishing project for 2013. Uh, and it's a really good book. So uh, her arena mode cover is unique and interesting. And oh, she got an that. artist to do a cityscape there with a little tiny floating figure that you hardly notice uh, until you look a little bit closer. But it's still a beautiful image, even from a distance. So it kind of fits what we were talking about. All right, uh, so Jeff, you were talking about uh, nodding about some of those cupboards you've seen uh, with copyrighted so, images. Uh, so I just I remember uh, an incident on Kindle boards about a few years ago that was very big. Somebody was stealing cover art, just steal, just completely lifting it from artist sites, not even trying to alter it or anything. So it made me think of that. All um, right. one, one thing that always stands out to me is I think the lettering. I've noticed this on a lot of homemade indie covers. The lettering is like maybe there will just be one. There will just be one layer. Maybe there won't be any outlines or, or shadows or anything done to. I mean, it'll look like there's some there's something that that looks really bad that I steal that I see a lot in self published. That's just I don't know, I, I, maybe maybe the text is too simple or it's not it's not built up enough. I don't know. It just you can just tell right away that somebody made this at home. Or like the color seconds. is something bizarre, like it's like <laughs> red and everything, and it just clashes with everything else. Yeah, sure. I've seen that. <laughs> That's exactly what you're talking about. All right. Um, Carly, uh, we are actually getting a request from somebody who works for an indie book publisher, works for Smashwords, so uh, I'm going to see if I can get them in and uh, circle them and get them in here. But Carly, why don't you talk about some of the big no-nos you see? I know you could talk about cover design for a four-hour chat alone if you wanted to, but why don't you talk about some of the big no-nos that you see? Okay, well, the thing that I actually hate the most doesn't matter any, I mean, obviously using copyrighted images is really bad, but the thing that really gets under my skin is when the image is clearly not high enough of a quality to be printed. It, it, most computer screens nowadays are 90, 96 DPI, 96, um, and that means that, you know, there's, there's dots of light that form, you know, there's 96 of them in an inch. 96 this way, 96 that way, square. And I think, doesn't matter, whatever. I'm not a scientist, okay, you guys? <laughs> but what's important is, you know, even if it looks okay on your screen, print is 300 dpi, which is three times as many dots as your computer screen has, which means that, you know, a lot of times people get stuff printed and it's 72 DPI, 96 DPI, and you can tell, and there's going to be, you know, pixels, and it's going to be all nasty color, and there's going to be scribbly lines all over the place, and that, that really upsets me because that's clearly not somebody who knows anything about printing at all, and if they could just know that it needs to be 300 dpi, then that would have solved everything. And a lot of times it's because, you know, you start with an image that you found online or whatever, and, you know, it's, and it's not big enough. And it, it, and you can't just scale it. You can't just make it bigger because that's, that's not how um, information on computers work. Like, that's all, all the information there is, and you can't just, like, hope and wish and there's going to be more information. Uh, <laughs> some other um, no-nos, I don't know, I think, I think at the base minimum for independent publishers is that your book cover has to look professional. If it doesn't look professional, if it doesn't look clean and like printed properly and like I said, the right DPI and your colors are like if it's super dark and you can't see exactly what's happening because you didn't care enough to change, alter it, basically, like then then you're you're giving the rest of us a bad name because we are professionals and you know we're we're trying to you know we're trying to compete with the traditional publishers and you're you're giving the rest of us a bad name. All right. Uh I am actually trying to invite someone into here right now, and my invite button has vanished. I know I can have 11 people in here, so I don't know where my button went. Uh, let me close the control room and see if that does not help. All right. Does anybody else have an invite button on their app? <laughs> um, you're not asking the right person. I had a hard time just getting on here. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. My little 
add a person button has vanished. Where would uh, it be? That's not good. So, and then it's just asking me to add recent apps. All right, well, I'll get to another question and let people start talking while I sit What's and... Okay, no, wait, I have, I, have one thing, I have one thing to share. Okay. Yes. And that's, that's, one of the things that you had said was too many things on a cover, um, and some people said, you know, type, type faces you can't read, and I would just like to share my, my fail from last year with my first publication of Mother Goose. This is what, this is what Mother Goose looks like now, and it's, I really like it. It's a big mouse, and you can read the type, and it looks great, you know, about that big. But, but this is not the first cover from from Mothership Goose, and this is this is I should have asked another designer. In fact, I did ask another designer, and she told me that it was wrong, and I ignored her and published the book anyway. This is my first cover, which, as you can see, there's like a million things going on. Okay, and then there's the you know the typeface is this warbly little thing over here, and it's, it was a disaster, and people didn't even know it was a book. Like, sitting next to my other books, I'd be like, oh, look, this is a book, too. And they were like, really? That's a book? It doesn't look like a book. Okay, so my cover was, I mean, it's a nice illustration, but it was so not right that people didn't even know it was a book. Okay, so that, <laughs> so, so no one's immune. So take other people's advice. If they tell you, I don't, can't read that typeface. Listen to them, okay? Listen. Sorry, go ahead. I'm done. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've covered editing and proofing, considerations for uh, printing. One of the questions we had from a Kickstarter backer, Jessica, asked, uh, building a meaningful platform, how do you do it? How do you go get fans and readers for your Facebook uh, that aren't your mom? So let's start with, uh, let's start with Bobby here. How do you get fans and readers? Oh, uh, any way you can. Uh, no. Uh, um, look, appearances. I do a lot of uh, conventions. I do, mm -hmm. you know, read like that. That's one way to get people to know you and get to know your books. Online, um, I have a, a constant presence, um, you know, with Facebook and Twitter and Google+, Plus, et cetera, et cetera. And so yeah, getting out there, meeting people, even even if you're just meeting people, you know, through social media, getting out there and connecting with them, and not, and not just actively trying to sell your book to them all the time, because um, I find I found with social media, there are those authors that get on there and every post that they do is buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, and I found myself ignoring theirs. I wouldn't even bother to read their post anymore because I knew what they were going to say. And so I try to, in addition to the occasional, hey, I have a book out or try this, I started doing things like talking about the writing process or how my day went writing-wise and found that a lot of readers were really excited to hear, you know, of what went into it. And, and then they were interested in finding out, out about the book because they've heard me talk about my, what I was so, so different things like that, just to make a connection with people, and on a on a personal level, as opposed to just me trying to sell them something. Okay. Um. Thank you. So let's talk, uh, Jeff. How do you get your audience? I know you have a pretty good social media following. Um. Well, I think initially it was reaching out to a lot of book bloggers and, uh, early on, and. I put links in my book saying, hey, come talk to me on Twitter or come talk to me on Facebook so readers are kind of openly invited to come give me their feedback. And I think that helps. Um, Rafflecopter giveaways will build up your social media following, um, Twitter and Facebook. And I think it's important to just be there to engage people in conversation and try to find interesting things to post that would probably appeal to your readers but don't have anything to do with selling your books. Um, try to try to do more of that on on Facebook too, where you just post something, it could be an interesting, I know people who like my books like supernatural things, so you know anything that would kind of fall into that category that's entertaining or interesting, or I think I just posted a, um, something on, I know everyone that reads my book is someone who likes to read, so I posted an interesting article yesterday about the neurological changes that occur in your brain while you read and, and stuff like that, so I think it's just staying active and not not being a hard seller, but 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 
remember that if people are people like you because you're you're, you're basically you're an entertainer. You you write mm -hmm. novels. People are are following you because they want more of your entertainment. So try to you know be entertaining on Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, and don't really worry about selling your stuff. And then when you do have something come out, everyone will help share your 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 stuff because you haven't been spamming them all year um, with buy links. So okay. I think just yeah. Just being there, staying active, and, and try to be interesting. And, and All right. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I have a message from Blake. Uh, she says, um, oh, she's got a couple things. I've, I've gotten distracted trying to get this person in. Um, make sure the image is the right quality, which is a much higher DPI, just like Carly was saying. No point in printing a crappy image. Um, if you don't know about printing, ask someone who does. Uh, but as far as building a platform, she says, uh, as to building a platform, choose a target, choose a Twitter handle. She chose Comic Book Girl because she wanted people to know she talks about comics. The more specific you are, the better chance someone will follow you and take interest. Be consistent. Tweet or Facebook a couple times a day sounds easy, but it's very easy to get sidetracked. Keep putting out content as much as possible. Uh, and also reply, especially when you're starting out, write everyone back. She says, in my first year of Twitter, Facebook, I was probably writing 200 replies a day easily. They don't have to be long, but they must, you must keep a dialogue going. I know I found Blake because she followed me on Twitter uh, and was willing to reply about things. So uh, definitely engaging your audience. I, I can support that, get behind that. Uh, anybody else have anything they want to throw in on building a meaningful audience? No, I, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say you're you're absolutely right though with the with the replies. I get questions a lot, um, not necessarily about books. Um, I get questions about writing, uh, kind of a lot a lot like the questions for a lot of these type of questions. And I try to I respond to everyone because you know someone took the took a moment to actually sit down and and write you know something to me. Worth it to me to to spend a few minutes. And yeah, so that's and that's a good way to build up too. Plus, helping uh, other others promote. You know, if a friend of mine puts out a book, you know, it doesn't it doesn't hurt me to go in there and say, hey, you know, if you like my stuff, you might enjoy so and so's book here. And you know, sometimes that you get all these authors back and forth helping cross promote one another. That you know. Like if if one have different audiences, but there there are people that might enjoy you know of us, but they wouldn't know about us without things like this where we're cross we're all kind of crossing one another. So yeah, definitely. Um, you know that cross promotion is important, especially because you know writers are readers, and uh, when people are asking you questions about writing. Chances are they like to read books and are looking to buy books. So um, if you engage with them, and they're going to be a good audience for you. So that's great. Uh, this person that we have commenting that, unfortunately, I can't get in. I cannot reschedule the event. Um, but I am. if you comment on the Google or you tweet at MatterDeep, I will put your comments on the air for the next uh, about 15, 20 minutes that we have left. Uh, I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name, but Adric Mayal uh, is a works for Smashwords, I really apologize about the dog, and says that one of the things that they deal with in their job is that they get people trying to do their own covers. He, he sees a lot of people trying to do their own covers. And uh, some people are talented enough to do it, and some people need to take a self-assessment and decide if they need to look elsewhere. Uh, you know, you might be able to find a cover for a hundred bucks on DeviantArt, and it might seem like a lot of money, but if you really care about your book, you can try to scrape together and figure out how to do it. So, um, and I would advise against using the templates on CreateSpace, not only because um, they're not the best design, but also because if everybody uses those templates, it's not going to make your book stand out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, other questions that we have going. Um, Bobby, tell us about how you get to be a guest at so many conventions. Um, what started? Um, contact conventions and and tell them who I was and you know just get to know them and then see if they were accepting guests uh, to conventions and 
I've been convention so long now that it's it's pretty it's pretty nice that they're actually coming to me a lot of times and saying, "Would you like to come to our show?" Um, to do conventions is also how much you're willing to do at the conventions. You know, people come and sit at their table and sell their books is fine. People like that, but you know, telling them you're willing to do panels or you know, whatever events during the day and go and do those things. That makes, that kind of makes you a little more valuable to the convention to come out because you're not just sitting there hawking your books all day, but you can actually, you know, be part of the programming. And, you know, things, so if you help promote the, the convention, I found that that helps a lot too because, you know, the conventions go, hey, you know, you were pretty good at promoting us. I uh, would love you to come back. And so you, you start to, it's almost like building your, your getting your uh, return readers who will pick up your second and third book. The conventions are kind of the same way. It's a it's very similar uh, way you treat them. You're, you know, get it to, you get to know them. You know, you're not just actively trying to get them to buy something, but you get to where you have a back and forth dialogue with them and then you'll, you'll find that they will start inviting you that way or so asking you if you have ideas for panel things like that. Yeah, that's really good. Um, treating those convention people just like you would treat your best fans. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and new conventions are a great way for indie authors to get in because they're looking for guests and they might have one big headliner uh, like the Alabama Phoenix Festival just started up it's on its third year this year and they're really willing to have indie authors because you know they might get a couple people that people would recognize by name from TV but a lot of their guests are smaller they're not they're not Dragon Con they're not bringing in Stan Lee every year so right. they're a little more willing to bring people in yeah a lot of the there are a lot of small shows that are really good places to set up. Uh, they're generally inexpensive. They're usually comic or toy based, primarily, but they have a nice range in terms of guests that they have. They're usually fairly inexpensive for people to attend. So, as an author, a lot of times they will just give you a table. So, so you're not really out much. And so, if you're in the one day shows those are a pretty good way to get to it you know get your stuff out inexpensively without having to worry about travel and hotels and all of that thing where you just go spend four or five hours and those are those are good ways to get started <laughs> uh, we just had a recommendation uh, by a viewer for visiting lousybookcovers.tumblr.com. Uh, without being too judgmental, it's a good place for uh, authors and people looking to hire book cover artists to um, see what not to do. So lousybookcovers.tumblr.com, uh, and you could follow that if you have a Tumblr and get those. I saw one of mine on there. You saw one of yours on there? have to look and see. Oh, God, I don't want to. <laughs> no, oh, if you saw, yeah. No, I think, Teal, your cover is very nice. Uh, I don't think it would be on there. I've I got think... more than just that one out there, though. You know? <laughs> that, yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh, uh, so, so that might be worth taking a look at just for some <laughs> ideas of what not to do, um, mistakes you want to check your covers for. Uh, Carly, why don't you tell people about that cover contest that you participated in? Oh, the Cthulhu one? Yes. <laughs> it was a, a sexy Cthulhu novel. Oh, it was it was basically like a Sounds good. paranormal romance sort of um but it was supposed to be creepy and they it was sort of like a social experiment, like how many people are gonna think this is awesome and how many people are gonna see that it's actually hilarious? Like um and they, they held a a cover contest and they wanted the tropiest of trophy covers, and um, so that was fun doing research for that. Um, I, I didn't win. I didn't even get in the finalists. It wasn't rapey enough. Show it. Show it. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't. I mean, I don't have it printed. I don't know. Can I? Is it, is it on your blog? It's on your blog, right? Yeah. Can I like post a link or something? Yeah. Post a link in the comments to this, um, okay. and I'll try to get them in the show notes on YouTube too. Okay. Um, but that so that was fun. Um, looking for tropes 
and and I would say that most of them are tropes to avoid because you know if your if your book cover looks exactly like every other book cover that's in your genre like exactly like amen it, it's always good to have like you like you can look at a book and be like obviously that's a supernatural suspense novel like that's good to be able to look at it cuz cuz then you know like I really like those books I'm going to read that Absolutely. But, you know, if your book looks exactly like every other one, like, people will be like, oh, I already read that. Or, you know, it, it's boring. Like, don't, lame. I'm going to go find it, and then I'm going to put it in the comments. But Yeah, I think there's also a screen share feature. I'm going to see if I can get it and screen share it. Carly Strickland art, tropiest of tropes, right? That was what I should Google for it. <laughs> Uh, we went. We made a field trip to Books a Million, and we just walked through the YA section, and we started to notice things repeating over and over again, uh, like girl with her head cut off. Yeah. Um, yeah. And girl, yeah, girl, girl walking away was. dramatically from the camera, like walking away. <laughs> you know, like sometimes she looks back over her shoulder. You know, like that's. Don't do that. No, no flowing dresses unless like your main character is actually like a debutante and she has a coming out ball. Like, in don't don't put her in a billowing dress, Those walking around in the grass with no me. shoes on. Yeah, um, I'm gonna see if I can get the screen share to work. Something to keep in mind as you see this cover is that it was a mock-up, it was a pre-design, and that had it won, we were going to do original photography for it. So um, as you look at this cover, keep in mind that this is not finished. Uh, and desktop, let me start my screen share with your desktop. Uh, is it? Are you seeing it, people? If it's yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, awoken. Oh, there and this it was is. Our, this was my tagline. That is not dead. Which can eternal love. Uh, which is taking and changing one word from an H.P. Lovecraft quote, but we found, like, creepy eyes staring over people, girl with her head cut off, long flowy dress, um, crazy embellished swirly font. Uh, so those were some of the things that we... And, and, like, the random graphic shape, like, behind the text, like, like a swirly cloud, sort of... <laughs> and and what's, what's interesting, what's so interesting about uh, this... I think is that you've taken all these things, which all indicate that it's a YA novel, right? And if maybe one of these things was going on or two of these things was going on, it would be perfectly fine cover. It's just that the fact that all of these are happening, it's just like, there's so yeah. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But all right, so... Um, it's still kind of awesome. I don't know why. One of, one of the best things for... Uh, getting book sales as an independent author is getting reviews. So um, I guess I want everybody to take a turn talking about uh, what's one, at least one successful tactic, tactic that they used for getting reviews. So uh, let's start with Jeff, seeing how as uh, I'm constantly in awe of how many reviews are on Jenny Pox, and it's a fantastic book for anybody who's interested oh. in reading some paranormal uh, young adult. Well, it's not really young adult, and you probably you get a lot of reviews about angry that it's that's, not. Young those adult. are my one star reviews. <laughs> Your young star young reviews adult. are like, I assumed no. this was for my kid. <laughs> <laughs> I downloaded this for my twelve year old, and it turns out it's a horror novel with adult. Yeah, but it's cat. It's not categorized young adult anywhere. It just kind of happened. Um. Anyway, for the reviews, I'm not sure. I, I, I did a lot of querying of bloggers, like I said, probably from the fall of 2010 to 2011. Uh, I was off and on constantly querying bloggers, and by then I had about 73 reviews on it. And then I made it perma-free, and this was October 2011. And since then, it's up to about 412 was the last time I looked. And I think, I, I don't know, I guess the perma-free thing must have had a big impact on on. on why I got so many reviews, just because if thousands of people are downloading every month, eventually someone will review it. Um, I don't really know how to drive up why that, you know, then you have, like, the Fairy Metal Thunder, that's one you read, that's been permanent, that's been perma-free for at least a year and a half, and it hasn't had anything like the same results. Uh, so I think it's something about the book makes people want to review it. They, they, they kind of love it or they hate it, and they want you to know. And so I get some horrible, scathing one-star reviews and some five-star reviews that just... I can't even read because they make me feel too good about myself. <laughs> like, you know, so, um, 
I think there's something, I think it's something in the book itself that makes people want to review it because I can't point to any one thing I've done that everyone else hasn't done. You know, as far as yeah, you send it to a lot of book bloggers, and if you make it free, you'll get more. But that's about those are the only two things I can I think I've really done, which I think lots of people have done. So I don't. Um, but I do think it's important to, um, you know, if you write something that book bloggers like, or you, if you find some book blogger fans, really cultivate them, and then they'll always be there for you when you put out a new book to, you know, to read it and review it and. Uh, and maybe they don't have to be book bloggers, just anybody, really, <laughs> that will put reviews on Amazon, uh, any fans that you find. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's important to get things started, to have people that you can always, you can count on to put reviews up for you um, when a book's young. That's when I worry most about reviews is when a book just came out <laughs> and, and someone could come along and give it a one star and it's dead, you know. So I, I think it's mainly important to have the, the, the people there who are wanting to read more of your stuff in the future. All right. Uh, before we continue on, uh, Blake adds about conventions. Conventions are a great way to meet people, to make new contacts in the industry, and to get in touch with any fans that are interested in your work. It is meaningful to them to get a face-to-face -face opportunity uh, that you get to promote your work with. I love meeting anyone who has read my books, and it takes time me, uh, takes the time to come out and say hello. Uh, I personally, I met Teal and Bobby at a convention, mm -hmm. so uh, I can definitely agree. Conventions are a great way to network and to meet with fans. Uh, we also have a comment on covers. Something that authors try to do, in my opinion, is they want to tell the whole story on their covers. Less is more when it comes to covers. But uh, back to getting reviews. Bobby, how, how do you find success getting reviews? I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, it's, you know sometimes they ha I mean, when they happen, they're great. Um, I do try to, when, I, when someone does post you, I do try to share the review and thank the person for taking the time to, uh, to share the review. You know, obviously, the you know rule number one is don't argue with people who don't like your book. And that's very important um, because it it will never go well for you as the writer. You know, you're immediately going to come off looking looking bad. So don't do that. But I mean, um, and sometimes you can turn a a negative review into a positive. Um, worked on a comic book uh, last year, just a little one-shot comic book I did for a publisher, and a gentleman just absolutely hated it, just did not like it, um, made his thoughts known, you know, reviews everywhere, and actually left a note on my uh, my website telling me why he didn't like it and, you know, how bad it was and all this, and we got to talking back and forth, and I thanked him for, you know, checking it out, and in in the the course of our talking, I even offered to like send him like a a free ebook short story. I had you know just there, and he actually he enjoyed that, and then went out and picked up a few other books I had written just from our conversations there, and then left positive reviews about those. Um, awesome. So yes, I, I that whole just <laughs> the, the people the readers, yeah. You know, just going back and forth and talking to the readers. So, yeah, I think if they reach out to you, that's great. You know, mm -hmm. with, with that, I wouldn't go after someone who just happened to put a, a, ne a negative review somewhere. But you know, and to talk up, start up a conversation. But yeah, if they they reach out to you, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a few on Amazon where, where yeah, there are some negative points. It's like okay, just you know, don't you don't you don't there. But yeah, we're reaching to my website. Yeah, 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 and th yeah. not much good can be gained from arguing. Uh, in fact, it's it's kind of a good warning for people right now to know that uh, if you argue with reviewers, you will end up featured on a Goodreads community, um, <laughs> and everybody will blacklist your book. So do not argue with negative reviews, whether or not they uh, obviously haven't read your book, or they are religiously offended, or they just decided to tear you apart that day. Don't argue with it. Some people just won't like your book. Yeah, and and you will sometimes get negative reviews, and I think Jeff, you mentioned something like this. You know, people didn't like it because it wasn't what they thought it was going to be, not because they didn't like it. It's just mm -hmm. oh, a young adult book, so I'm going to give you one star. You know, and it doesn't matter what whether they liked the book or not. It just what they wanted. Oh, uh, some people, some of my readers would, would want me tortured and killed for my book. I think based on their reviews. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh. 
one thing, and this really goes along with a lot of advice that I've heard um, just from doing marketing research. Blake says, asking for people's input on Amazon reviews has been great for me. Some are positive, some are negative. But always, I think it's important to appreciate the readers that take the time to post a review. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you just ask people to leave a review, they'll do it. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a call to action, even if you just post it on your Facebook. You know, they find statistically when you tell people to like a post, they do it. When you tell people to uh, post a review, some of them are going to go out and do it. So simply asking helps. And that can be good to put in the back of your book. I know some writers do that, and they get a lot of reviews that way. Yeah. yeah. And, and there's these nice little things called QR codes that are, uh, if you go to kwa.org, I think it is, just type in kwa on Google and you'll find it. Uh, it'll generate a QR code for you, and you can stick it in your book, and then people with smartphones can just scan it and uh, go post a review on Amazon. So you could link your Amazon product page and say, please post a review. So using the, you posting links at, to make it easier, uh, asking people to review helps. Uh, we have a few minutes here uh, because we started a little late before uh, I'm going to wrap it up and have everybody say goodbye. But I, I did want to ask if anyone here has done a blog tour. I know Jeff has, but if anybody else has done one, uh, if it's worth, if they think it's worth the investment. I anybody have, but Jeff, or should just Jeff take this one away? I have done it. Okay, how was it, Teal? I, I don't. I'm not trying to take it away, but just want to let you know that I've done a couple. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm very mixed about doing blog tours. Maybe it's because I'm such a new author. I'm not getting a lot of interest from uh, bloggers. And I do have a PR firm that was putting those together. But And one of the things that's hard right now, and I'm, I don't know how many of you all write YA other than me. I know I think most of you write YA, right? Or at least... I do. Jeff does. Uh, Blake's is kind of borderline. It's, it's for right. young, oh, but yeah. it's not... But I think um, every of us do. There's such a trend right now um, with the NA category that that is what the bloggers are wanting to focus their attention on. It seems to me, and I don't know that factually. New but, adult for anyone who doesn't know what that yeah, is. Sorry. Um, and because of that, because my books are fantasy, um, I, I'm feeling or in, in urban fantasy, I feel like they're not wanting to put the effort into putting my information out there, not because they have anything against me or my book. They've just got so many NA books, and that's what everybody's wanting to read about, and their readers that come to their blogs are wanting to know about the new NA books, um, it seems to me. And I'm not, I don't know factually. So I get, I have found a lot of people enjoy doing the blog tours. I have not really seen a good return on investment but I don't necessarily have the best sales tracking for all of that. I just know basically, you know, I'll tell you, for me, what seems to be doing the best so far, and I hate to say it, is paying for the Facebook ads. I've gotten a lot of good results paying for those Facebook ads, and they're very expensive. I don't do them often, but that is what seems to be the best return of investment for me at this point. Um, but with the blog tours, I think it depends partially <coughs> on your popularity and what blogs you are able to get for your blog tour. All right. How, how do you feel about blog tours, Jeff? I like them. Um, I've enjoyed the ones I've done, especially if I hire, you know, some bloggers will, will take all the stuff I don't want to do, like making graphics and, and doing all the logistics, and they'll do that for like $50 or something to organize a blog tour or $100. I like, but I, my approach to blog tours and in general promoting in the book blog community is that I've learned that it's not really going to lead directly to a lot of sales. Even if you do a giant blog tour, you're just not going to get a lot of sales. And so my my goals in doing anything with the book blog world is again to get those people who will be fans of my book and will put reviews on Amazon and things like that, and lead it'll lead indirectly to sales. So everything I do. In the book blog world is really all about just sort of building up relationships with book bloggers, and you know finding new fans in that in that community. But I don't expect to sell books directly from it. I expect it to have to help me get a lot of reviews on Amazon, which help me sell it later or to other readers or something. And I, if I can add to that, I will agree with him on that. I have made some really wonderful contacts via the book blog tours. Um, and to me, that's wonderful, mainly not even for the review part of it, but there's a lot of them that I chat with 
on in a very friendly way because I do consider them my friends on Facebook and they're extremely supportive like he was saying they will end up being big cheerleaders for you but I just love the interaction I have with them and I learn about them. the great thing about having that interaction then with them especially on Facebook is that I end up learning about other authors and books that I may not have heard of otherwise because they end up letting you know about people that they have found that they love yeah, book bloggers are a lot of fun to talk. You know, to talk to a lot of some. There's some great people out there, and it's just it's it gives you something to do, <laughs> and um, I think it's uh, and you know as far as the hard nosed business side of it, I think that the reviews are the thing you're getting from the book blogs and not direct sales. That was I wasn't saying that you know I just used them for their reviews. Or anything. <laughs> no, no, no I, I was just actually realizing that you were making a very good point. It's something I feel, and I'm. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm not looking for that anymore either as a way for me to build up a bunch of sales. I don't know that it's going to do that unless I was a really big author that got a lot of viewers to go see that information. And I and you know, so for me, I will continue doing it because I enjoy the interaction. But I don't necessarily know that there's a real return on on investment as far as sales goes. But hopefully. Yeah. Will then follow you to your website and learn, and and will start checking out your site that might not have heard of you before. Absolutely. That's yeah. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't really do blog tours, but I've done guest blogs before. Yeah. You know, for people when they've asked, and and yeah, it's it's yeah. I don't see a like a huge uptick in sales, but but I will notice that all of a sudden I'm getting exits to my website. You know. So it lit. Yeah. You know what I really love, real quick, uh, about. Um, working with bloggers more than blog tours is doing release day blitzes and cover reveals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of fun with them doing those because they get really, really jazzed about doing those. Cover love. I mean, cover, cover love. They love doing cover. And I love that they love it because that's the best way for people to find out about your book, obviously, is if they see your cover and start associating what that cover looks like and your name with that book, obviously, that you need that association. Um, I've got people that when I've gone to cons and, and book festivals that have seen my banner for my book and like I can see them making a beeline to it it's not because they love me they've seen the book and they will come up to me and say I've seen this book all over the place and it's and they're recognizing that cover so that's a big thing for me is doing I, I love doing the release day blitzes and the cover reveals uh, we have a comment uh, from Sam. He says, a couple negative reviews make your positive reviews more trustworthy. Seeing all five-star reviews is suspicious because not everyone is going to like everything. I agree. So, yes. uh, you know, that guy who hates you is going to make it more legitimate uh, that, you know, the people who love you probably do also seriously love you. Uh, all five-star reviews make people worried that it's all your mom or you on dummy accounts. So uh, we now, it's 2.16 uh, in my world, which means it's 3.16 in the uh, Eastern Standard Time this was scheduled. So uh, we're just going to go around quickly and, uh, you know, give everybody can give a plug for one book before we finish off. And I thank everybody for joining us today. I know we had a lot of technical difficulties, and I'm sorry that Blake was not able to make it on. But uh, I'd like to thank her for participating how she could over Twitter, uh, over Facebook. So um, I'll start quickly wrapping up... Uh, Olympia Heights, my series, uh, Supernatural, yeah, YA, Greek Gods as Teenagers. Uh, the final book of the series comes out in March. So uh, Olympia-Heights.com. You can also find me at AmyLeeStrickland.com. Okay, Kyle. All right. Uh, I want to plug Stay Out of Sparkles. It is a collection of vampire short stories illustrated by Carly Strickland. So it's got some fantastic illustrations in it. Um, let's see... That one might have been a little too racy to show. This one's pretty fun, though. Um, so, some pretty um, pretty fun stuff. Um, it's basically what everything I think vampire fiction can be, and what maybe it necessarily isn't right now. All right. Uh, next person on my order is Bobby. Uh, yeah, uh, well, my... my that I worked on is um, IDW Zombies vs. Robots uh, No Man's Land, which is a collection of short stories. Um, that will be out in February. That is my next, uh, the next book of mine that will be out. So. All right. Uh, Carly? Uh, I, guess, I mean, I guess I've already plugged Mothership Goose is my newest book. Um, it's, uh, 
it, it's basically like, I'm sorry, y'all. Um, nursery rhymes, but with like jetpacks and stuff. Like there's the three blind mice. <laughs> And they've got jetpacks, and they're terrorizing the poor space lady. So, you know, jetpacks, rocket ship, all the helmets, like 1960s science fiction, but traditional nursery rhymes. Um, so, yeah. All right, Jeff. Um, I guess I'll just pull up my most recent one. This is... I'm not good with the web camera. It's really dark anyway. Anyway, it's called The Unseen. It's of a girl who's, um, I guess she has... Uh, witchcraft powers and doesn't know it and she keeps seeing demons and ghosts and stuff all her life and so she stays drunk in order to avoid seeing them and, and then eventually she can't stay drunk anymore and has to deal with it. I don't know how else to summarize. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. <laughs> and Amy ran away. So I'm just sort of... Find something. Uh, teal. Uh, yes. Um, my series is The Reaping Chronicles. Book one came out last year, which is in section undone. Should be out uh, by the end of the year. Hope I'm shooting for August for that one to be out. And it is about the angel of karma and the fight of good versus evil. And there's um, a lot of interesting, fantastical creatures in there along with the angels and demons. So it is an epic kind of story as far as length. So if you read that one, be prepared to have a long haul. All right, and uh, I'm going to plug. I was hoping I could find my copy of it, but I have no idea where it went. But I'll plug for Blake because she's been participating, uh, contributing from Facebook. Uh, Arena Mode, check that out on Amazon.com. It's about, uh, it's basically, you know, the question of if, you know, Superman fought the Hulk, who would win? Um, people with superpowers competing in an arena for a fight to the death, and one guy pretending to have superpowers so that he can win some money. Uh, for something very important. So, uh, very fun. So that's it for us today. Thanks, guys, for coming. And uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. It went, and we'll be better at all getting on Google at that point. Yes, <laughs> pay attention to which uh, standard time we're doing. Yes, yes. Time zone conversions. Find a website to convert it for you, because I always make that mistake. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. And uh, you. have a good weekend. You too. Bye.